Good afternoon and welcome to today's Downing Street press conference. I'm pleased to be joined by Chief Medical Officer Professor Chris Whitty and also our Chief of Defence Staff Sir Nicholas Carter. Before CDS talks through the fantastic work that our brilliant armed forces have been doing during this crisis, let me give you an update on the latest data from the COBRA coronavirus data file. And I can report that through the government's ongoing monitoring and testing programme as of today, 559,935 people have now been tested for the virus, 133,495 have tested positive, and of those who have contracted the virus, 18,100 have very sadly died, and we express our deepest condolences to the families and friends of these victims, and my heart goes out to every single one of those who have lost a loved one throughout this crisis. As a government, we continue to take the steps necessary to slow the spread of this virus. The social distancing measures that people have overwhelmingly adhered to have meant that fewer people have, have needed hospital treatment. That has protected our NHS capacity as we continue through the peak of this virus, and it has undoubtedly helped to save lives. At every point in this crisis, we've considered the scientific and the medical evidence that we've received very carefully and we've been deliberate in our actions so that we take the right steps at the right time. Now, I know it's been tough going, tough going for businesses, for families, for vulnerable members of our communities up and down the country. And it's been a physical strain as we adapt to living and working at home while not seeing our family and our friends in the usual way we would like to. It's been an economic strain as businesses have had to furlough staff which is why the Chancellor launched the various business support measures to help see businesses and workers through these difficult times. But it's also been an immense mental strain on everyone. People stuck at home, families worried about their finances, and the elderly more isolated than we'd ever want them to be. We are making progress through the peak of this virus, but we're not out of the woods yet, as Sage advised last week. That's why the measures we introduced must remain in place for the time being. The greatest risk for us now, if we eased up on our social distancing rules too soon, is that we would risk a second spike in the virus with all the threats to life that that would bring, and then the risk of a second lockdown, which would prolong the economic pain that we're all going through. And that was the point that Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England, also made earlier on today. So with that in mind, last Thursday, I set out the five principles that will guide our approach going forward to the next phase, and which must be satisfied before we are willing and in a position to make any changes, which will, of course, be based on the advice that we receive from SAGE. That way, we will ensure that our path out of this crisis is sure-footed, protecting both the public's health, but also our economy. If we stick to our plan, if we take the right steps at the right time, we can get through this crisis and I know we will. There's no hiding the scale of this tragedy. But even in our darkest moments, the crisis has also shone a light on the best amongst us. And the nation has come together to applaud our heroic NHS staff, our carers, every week. And we pay tribute to their dedication, to their professionalism, and the care with which they look after those who have fallen sick. And with General Carter here today, I think it's only fitting to pay tribute to the amazing work of our fantastic armed forces uh, and their whole MOD led by Defence Secretary Ben Wallace. They have been there every step of the way, helping us to build the new NHS Nightingale, Nightingale hospitals to reinforce our critical care capacity. Supporting our local resilience forum in delivering personal protective equipment where it's needed most and helping also to deliver the mobile labs, which are critical to ramping up our testing capacity right across the country. And as a result of those efforts and that teamwork, hospitals have been able to treat more patients. As a result, they save more lives. And we've ensured that the peak of this virus has not overwhelmed the NHS. And today our armed forces are again part of that team as we announce two new deployments to the NHS Nightingale facilities in Harrogate and Bristol. And across the UK, this extra hospital capacity, which itself comes on top of the 33,000 additional beds we've managed to free up across the NHS, that's the equivalent of building an extra 50 district general hospitals. 
And as I said, that has safeguarded the capacity in our hospitals, both to care for coronavirus patients, but also to make sure other people get the urgent care or the emergency treatment they need. People used to joke in this country that you could never build a hospital that quickly. Well, we didn't just build one, we built seven, and we thank our armed forces for helping to make that happen. And you know, for many countries around the world, including modern democracies, the sight of their military on the streets in a national emergency could be a cause for concern or even trepidation. But for the British people, the sight of our armed forces working side by side with our brilliant NHS staff offers a calm reassurance that the task is at hand and that we will come through this crisis. Now, I make no bones about it. There have been challenges. There still are challenges. We're not there yet. We continue to ramp up the testing capacity, which will play a really important role in the next phase of the crisis. Amidst a global shortage in personal protective equipment, we've distributed over a billion items to the front line where it's needed most. We've just brought in Lord Dayton, who helped organise the London Olympics to boost our domestic supply even further. And I'm on the phone every day pursuing the next batch of deliveries from abroad with the support of our tireless diplomatic service. And the first of several new deliveries landed from Turkey in the early hours this morning. We will only come through this global pandemic if we come together as a nation and if we bring other countries around the world together so that we can rise to this international challenge. And as we work with our partners abroad to get the PPE we need, to get the ventilators we need to pursue a vaccine for this terrible virus, we're also working night and day to return stranded British nationals from all four corners of the world. We've kept airports open and airlines running to bring over a million Brits home on commercial flights, a massive endeavour. And on top of that, at the FCO, we set up a £75 million special charter arrangement with the airlines, and that's already brought home over 13,000 people on 63 flights from more than a dozen countries. And we're organising more charter flights in the days ahead from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, New Zealand, Nigeria and Sierra Leone. So at home and abroad, we're meeting the whole range of challenges that coronavirus presents. And if we stick together, and if we stay the course, we will defeat this virus for good. And I think I'll now turn over to Sir Nick to brief us on the latest military involvement in the effort. First Secretary, thank you very much. Um, the First Secretary has asked me today to give you an update on what the armed forces and defence as a whole is doing in support of the government's response to the virus. Up front, I would say that our role has been entirely in support of the heroic healthcare workers on the front line. That's both the NHS and social care, with humility very much being our watchword in the way that we give that support. We've done it in a variety of ways. We've supported, first and foremost, the Ministry of Housing, Community and Local Government and the devolved administrations through the national spine of local regional fora that the First Secretary referred to and we have dozens of liaison officers embedded into each of those fora. It's a tried and tested system that's been used many times in the past, whether for delivering military aid to the civil authorities through for the foot and mouth or for flooding or for wildfires. It's frequently exercised and there are very close relationships which give great confidence between all of those who are working on those teams at the lower level. And I think it's important this because of course it's that delegated sense at that level which works because it makes them much more responsive and much more flexible to local demand whether it's for ambulance drivers or for testing or for whatever else with decentralization being so much of the key to the way some of this is done and the defense secretary delegated authorities to this level early in the early in the crisis which has proved to be extraordinarily successful we've also been giving support to the department for health and social care and of course the nhs first and foremost this has been a logistic task and I would say that I think in all of my more than 40 years of service, this is the single greatest logistic challenge that I've come across. I'll just give you a scale of the problem. In 25 days since we started working together with the NHS, they've gone from some 240 customers they deliver to normally to nearly 50,000 customers. This has involved creating 260,000 square feet of distribution warehousing. That's nearly four football fields worth. And, and some 38 additional delivery routes per day. That's the equivalent to driving three times round the world. 
That is a major logistic challenge. We've, of course, been involved in the Nightingales, which the First Secretary referred to, but we've also been involved in planning and what we call command and control, providing additional resilience to hard-pressed staff. And we've got dozens of people embedded both in Skipton House, but also in Victoria House, where the DHSC headquarters is. We're involved in testing, both in terms of playing a role in helping design the system, but also in manning some of the regional test centres, and adopting some innovative approaches, like mobile pop-up centres, which will make it possible to get to the decentralised areas that I described early. And a brigade commander we have there, Brigadier Lizzie Faithful Davis, and her team have been very imaginative in the way that they've taken this forward. And of course, we've provided an aviation task force that's been able to support the communities from Scotland down to the Channel Islands, in Northern Ireland and from Wales to the east coast of England. We've been involved in helping the Foreign Office with repatriations and supporting our overseas territories, where we have security advisory teams deployed now in several of them. And of course, we've deployed ships, HMS Argus, to do just that. And we've been involved with the Cabinet Office Rapid Response Unit, with our 77 Brigade helping to quash rumours from misinformation, but also to counter disinformation. Between three and 4,000 of our people have been involved, with around 20,000 available the whole time at high readiness. We probably have at the moment some 73 ongoing tasks, and we've probably completed about 30. What's interesting is it's been very much a whole force, not just of regular military from all the three services, but reservists as well. Some 15% of the force has been reservists. It's involved defence civilians, defence contractors, scientists from Port and Down, and something called the Engineer and Logistics Staff Corps, where we bring in people from industry who work inside the military in times of crisis and provide expert support for how we might link into the civilian community to bring forward skills and indeed industrial support. The skills have been about planning, logisticians, medics, engineers, and CIS or IT based people. And the role has been very much about catalyzing, designing, and supporting. And I'll just single out one individual to give you an example of the sort of backgrounds that we're talking about. A young major called Major Eb Mukhtar has been mobilized from the reserve. He's really stepped up to the plate. His daytime job is as a logistics expert who runs Google's transport network across Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. He has been part of the supply team that's been working on how we distribute PPE. He's designed an e-portal in partnership with eBay which will in due course manage individual customers. And he designed a bulk supply chain for distribution of PPE to all of the NHS regions and trusts. Now, despite all of this, we are still involved, of course, in protecting the country, and there are essential operations that must continue, whether that's defending the homeland with the nuclear deterrent or protecting British and UK airspace more generally, whether it's overseas operations in Afghanistan, the Middle East, Africa, and further afield, or whether it's about fielding essential operational capability. And what we do as we do this is to take great care not to endanger the population. All of this is a truly national endeavor. We've even mobilized 99 year old veterans. And I think everyone would agree that Captain Tom Moore embodies the sense of service and duty ingrained in our armed forces. Our armed forces are drawn from every part of the United Kingdom and much of the Commonwealth. And they take great pride in serving the, the communities that they are part of. Everyone is experiencing real challenges at the moment. And it makes me feel immensely proud of our collective national effort in pulling together behind those on the front line to combat this unprecedented challenge, which I firmly believe we will defeat together. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Nick. Chris, would you talk us through some of the latest data, please? Uh, thank you much, First Secretary. And before I do, can I just, on behalf of my colleagues in the NHS, uh, thank the armed forces enormously for the assistance they've given us, which has been absolutely terrific. Uh, these slides are, uh, I think, familiar to most people who watch this. Uh, the first uh, is a, uh, a look at transport usage uh, in, in the country. Uh, and it's really as a proxy for our people continuing to uh, stay at home uh, except for essential uh, business, uh, business. And as you can see, although there is some bumping al along, uh, it has broadly remained very stable, uh, despite the fact that people have had to do this for a considerable now period.
period of time, and there is further time. We're going to have to do this uh, if we wish to uh, pull the peak of this uh, right down. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at new cases in the UK, these are test positive, whether they're in hospital or out of hospital. As you can see, uh, this is broadly flat with a slight trend uh, downwards over the last uh, several days, uh, really back to about the 8th of April, but uh, not a steep uh, descent at this point. Next slide, please. Uh, and if you look at people in hospital uh, with COVID-19, uh, looking across the country, uh, the situation is either uh, improving, and I think it's pretty clearly improving, for example, in London, uh, or broadly flat uh, across all four nations. Next slide, please. Uh, if you look uh, at people who have sadly died uh, in hospital, this is not all deaths, but uh, this is probably the majority of those who sadly died with COVID. Uh, what you can see again uh, is that the very steep uh, upward climb that there was up to um, the earlier part of this month has now flattened off uh, over the last uh, week and a half. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is a slide uh, we use uh, just really to track the trajectory uh, between different countries. I should be clear that trying to compare different countries using these kind of data is notoriously difficult, but it does show the trajectories uh, between the different countries uh, with the UK using hospital data, which is our most uh, steady source of data over that time. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just one slide we thought we would add in in addition, uh, because I think it makes a point which I think is important for people uh, fully to understand. And what you can see here, this is the seven day rolling average uh, for uh, deaths, sadly, in several countries, um, uh, including the UK. And the reason I thought it was sensible to put this in was for people to see that uh, even in those countries which uh, started their epidemic curve earlier than the UK uh, and uh, which are still ahead, the downward slope from uh, the point where we change is a relatively slow one. And we should anticipate the same situation in the UK. We should not expect this to be a sudden fall away of cases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, let's turn to the media. Have we got Alison Holt there from the BBC? Yes. First Secretary, um, worrying figures today suggest a doubling in care home deaths in England in a virus that targets the, the elderly and the vulnerable. Do you see that as inevitable? I didn't catch the last bit of it. I'll let Chris Whitty talk about the, I think, the CQC. Repeat it. Why don't you, please? Thanks. Okay. So we've seen a doubling in care, or figures suggesting a doubling in care home deaths in England. In a virus that targets the elderly and the vulnerable, do you see that as inevitable? No, I don't think anything is inevitable. We're fighting uh, tooth and nail, striving every sinew to make sure we minimise the life lost in all contexts. I'll let um, Chris Whitty say a little bit uh, more about the CQC uh, data, which I think is going to be published, um, but obviously in care homes, whether it's on PPE testing, um, PPE uh, deliveries, whether it's on testing uh, across the whole range of things that uh, we're looking at, we are doing everything we can to make sure we provide the support to them uh, uh, to protect the care homes, to protect the workers there, and obviously to protect the residents as well. Of course, there is a, uh, it is a vulnerable part of our community, if you like, uh, and we are targeting all of our efforts to make sure that we protect and safeguard as best we can the most vulnerable in our society. Chris, do you, do you want to say anything on the CQC? Well, I, well I, not on the CQC because it hasn't yet published its report, but no. I think in terms of uh, care home uh, deaths, sadly, uh, your, your starting position is, of course, correct. Uh, in care homes, what we have is a large number of people uh, of the most vulnerable age for this virus. This is a virus which is particularly a, a virus of people who are older and particularly a virus which causes severe disease and uh, death in a minority, but an increasing minority as, uh, 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 as you go up in age, uh, and in those who have coexisting medical problems. And many people in care homes, of course, and nursing homes in particular, have coexisting medical problems. So they are a very vulnerable group, you're absolutely right. Uh, the numbers that have been ascribed to COVID directly in ONS statistics are still relatively modest. But I, I said repeatedly uh, in uh, data 
you know, the fact that the ONS said in their last weekly report, uh, 826 deaths, every one of them a tragedy, but uh, I think that will be an underestimate. And what, the, what we need to look at in these data and other data, if we want to get a true picture is, and I've said this right from the beginning, the all cause seasonally adjusted mortality over time. Uh, and that is because, as I've said again before, uh, deaths from COVID will be a combination of direct deaths from the virus and also indirect deaths if, for example, people are nervous about going into hospital. And I think one of the things we've been trying to make really clear is it is absolutely critical that if people have heart attacks, strokes, children have asthma, severe asthma attacks, any of the things that have severity, and this would include people in social care settings, uh, that the NHS remains absolutely able to manage emergencies as it always has been able to manage emergencies. But when we look back over this uh, epidemic, and I want to be really clear, we are not anywhere near uh, being able to say, right, that's done, we can now look back. When we are at that stage, I'm sure we will see a high mortality rate, sadly, in care homes, because this is a very, very vulnerable group and they're coming, people are coming in and out of care homes and that cannot, to some extent, be prevented. Alison, do you want to follow up on any of that? Just a quick follow up. I mean, families and staff in care homes have heard lots of promises about protective equipment, about testing. But what I'm being told is they're just still not seeing that on the ground. So what reassurance would you give them that they are being made a priority in this? Look, we're conscious that there's a challenge with care homes. I've said that um, in my earlier remarks, but we are doing everything we can. The situation is improving. We are getting uh, the PPE to those places that need it. We are working with uh, the military in relation to some of the mobile testing labs because we know that it's uh, difficult for uh, some people in, in care homes to, to access the testing. Um, we're, we've revised the, the guidance, or the, the NHS revised the guidance to make sure on discharge the uh, we're absolutely being very careful with those that go into care homes. We're doing everything we can. Uh, we understand the, the, their concerns, their anxiety. Uh, we, you know, I feel for those uh, who are living in care homes and are nervous about this or their loved ones, and we're doing absolutely everything we can to protect them. Robert Peston from, the IT, from ITV. Good afternoon. Um, representatives of the TSS a transport union have been told to prepare for a possible increase in a phased way of the railway service uh, between the 11th and 18th of May. Now, uh, you, you, we're obviously not looking at an exit from lockdown, but is that a timetable for modifications of the lockdown? And, and secondly, Overseas doctors and nurses working in the NHS pay a surcharge of hundreds of pounds a year, thousands if they've got families to use the NHS, given that they are putting their lives on the line to protect us. Is there a case for waiving that surcharge? Well, first of all, the dates that you described, I, I don't know where they come from. It's not something I recognise. And as uh, Chris Whitty uh, has rightly said, and as the Governor of the Bank of England has said, so you've got it from the public health, but also the economic uh, perspective, uh, it would be a mistake to take our eye off the ball right now. The focus is still delivering us through the peak, uh, and we're obviously reliant, as I said last Thursday, on the data that we get back from SAGE in a couple of weeks' time in order to even think about uh, the next phase. And uh, in relation to uh, people here from overseas working in our NHS and the Home Secretary has already outlined some measures to make sure that their interests are safeguarded. We pay tribute to the, the incredible job they do and of course uh, we want to look after them in every way possible. Rob, did you want to come back on any, any of that? Well, I just wonder, you didn't really say whether the surcharge would be, would, would be waived and just on, on these union representatives, is it just that their managers have just got it wrong? Well, I don't know the, on the uh, unions what information they've got, but I'm telling you that that, that is not a government uh, timetable. Uh, we've had lots of attempts to put that to us, and I understand why uh, people will try and do that. That is uh, absolutely not a timetable uh, that we're working to, that I recognise, or that is under consideration right now. And I'll defer to the Home Secretary uh, on uh, and the Health Secretary on issues around the uh, surcharge, but I think the point I would want to make really loudly and really clearly is we, we pay tribute to all those from overseas who are doing a heroic job in our NHS on the front line. Beth Rigby from Sky. Thank you. Uh, a question first to Professor 
witty, please. We've talked a lot about PPE shortages and trying to plug the gaps, but NHS workers just want to know they have the equipment they need when they turn up at work. Can you tell me when you expect the shortages to be resolved? Is it three days? Is it a week? Or can't you answer that question? And to the first secretary, please. The health secretary said today we've reached the peak of the crisis. And he said it was time to reopen the NHS for routine care. Is this the light at the end of the tunnel that we have been talking about and waiting for? And might we all look forward to some modest easing of restrictions on May the 7th when you review the lockdown? Uh, so there is certainly light at the end of the tunnel. There is a glimmer, but we're not, th we're not there yet. I think the, uh, the way I would describe it, uh, but I'll defer um, to Chris on where we are, we're coming through the peak, but we're not there yet. And I think the health sector is repeating what uh, CMO has already said, which is you know, one of the positives, one of the successes amidst all the challenges, which I'm uh, open to and, and accept, has been that we have kept NHS capacity with the headroom, not just to deal with COVID-19 patients, but to deal with all of those other people um, who have got uh, ailments, injuries, or ne who need treatment. I've heard Chris Whitty say it before, the NHS is still there for them. Um, and I think he wanted to echo uh, that point. Um, in terms of PPE, so I, I'm not an procure, international procurement expert, so in a sense I'm going to say what I'm told rather than pretend any expertise in this area. But it is very clear that at the moment we are tight at different times for different items of PPE. It's not, all, it's not everything at all times, but different things at different points have been very, very close to the line. And of course, uh, when you're close to the line, uh, inefficiencies in any kind of part of the system uh, tend to lead to local stockouts. So if you're very, very heavily uh, overstocked, that's less true. And this is why the support from the armed forces and so on has been so critical to trying to reduce this. So at this point in time, uh, we are still close to the line, but at a national level, uh, we're not uh, underwater on anything that I'm aware of. And I keep quite a close eye on this because I care very deeply about this, uh, as do all members of my profession. Uh, but of course, there may be local uh, issues, and I'm aware of them from my colleagues uh, along the way, uh, and all of us want to be in a position where there is a sufficient excess uh, over a long period of time that this can all be balanced out. But because of a combination of excellent work from the armed forces and mutual aid where different hospitals and care homes and others are sharing what they have, we have broadly, and this is a tribute to the services involved, managed a very difficult situation without yet getting to the point uh, where uh, that we're no longer able to cope with it. But I think we, you know, to, to promise now that in two or three days, this is all gonna be sorted in the context of the incredibly difficult, according to my colleagues, and I see absolutely no reason to disbelieve them, having read the international press, a, a credibly difficult situation where everybody, every country wants these and the suppliers are very limited, I, I think would be a mistake. I think what we need to do is we need to ma manage it as best it is possible to be managed and I'm very aware that my expert colleagues in this area are working the whole time on this and I care about it and uh, I, I check on this the whole time and they assure me uh, that they are and I can see that they are and that is why we've managed to keep just ahead at a national level with some significant local pressures from time to time. Beth, did you want to come back? Yeah, yeah just, just quickly in terms of the lockdown, I understand that you don't want to spell out exactly what you intend but the Irish Prime Minister has told the Irish people he will at least give them a roadmap by May the 5th, to give them a sense of how they might begin to work through this. Germany is allowing some smaller shops to reopen. I understand that you might want to flex the model, but the British people aren't silly. I mean, they understand what's facing them. Can't you at least give them some idea of, of what might be coming down the road? Well, that's why I set out these five principles, but, uh, and the key to, to that is recognising that we don't want to risk a second spike in the virus. And the challenge that we've got is that um, as the transmission rate comes down, we need to get more data as to precisely where it is uh, in, in order to inform the measures that we could actively consider. So I think it's, uh, I think the responsible thing to do, if I may say, at least on the data that we've got, is to make sure we've got that evidence before we start touting around ideas at the risk of them not being, uh, either us not being able to deliver them or taking them and then risking a second spike. And I do think, again, it was 
uh, it's something Chris has, has highlighted, but also Andrew Bailey, the Governor of the Bank of England. We must avoid a second spike. And so whilst I know people will be wanting us to give them more information, and the minute we can responsibly do so, based on the evidence, we will. At the moment, right now, I think the vast majority of people in this country recognise it, we've got to keep our eye on the ball because we're coming through the peak, but we're not done yet. Laura Makin Isherwood from British, Isherwood from British Forces News. Good evening. First Secretary of State, you've praised the work of the military today, but there are 20,000 personnel on standby to help in this crisis, and fewer than 3,000 have actually been deployed. So are you underutilising a pool of very skilled people that could essentially take the strain off the NHS further, perhaps be deployed to all NHS Nightingale hospitals? To the Chief of the Defence Staff, the government still says it hopes to reach 100,000 COVID-19 tests a day by the end of the month. Will you be helping to ensure that that target is met? Will you be taking over drive-through test sites, for example? And to Professor Quitty, if I may, scientists at Porton Down Laboratories are trying to work out what percentage or proportion of the population might have been infected with COVID-19. How are those figures looking? And the question you asked me, of course, we want to make sure we use all of our resources in the right way that complements and supplements the brilliant work of the NHS. And we're always talking and considering what more can be done. And I talked about the deployment to the new Nightingale hospitals. Uh, I've been talking with the Defence Secretary about the mobile testing labs and, and how we can deploy them in the future. But of course, it, you know, those are difficult decisions. We've got to make sure that we deploy our resources uh, where they add the greatest value and in the right way. So Nick, I don't know whether you want to go back on... The no, second question. I might have a go at the first part of your question as well. Um, I mean, the answer is that we have deployed all that we have needed to deploy at this stage in support of the organisations that we're working for. Um, there is more there if people need it, but the sort of skills and capabilities that are in the remaining 20,000 are not necessarily the ones that people need at this point in time. And to your question about testing, yes, we're working very closely uh, with the DHSC and with the NHS, and more broadly through the local forum that I described in my opening remarks. Um, because what we're trying to do is to help design the right system with the team in DHSC that can provide the sort of testing that customers need so that you match demand to supply in the right way. And that's why the innovative idea of pop-ups, rather like mobile libraries, we think will be a very useful way of going. And what we're trying to do at the moment is to upscale that idea so that we've got enough capacity to be able to get out into those areas which are harder to reach. So it's an overall system that's been put together at the moment. Um, it will be very sophisticated once it's completed. Um, and there's some very, really good people designing it. And we're working with those people to make it as good as it possibly can be. Chris, on the last point. On the last one. So you're absolutely right that uh, Port and Down has some of the best capacity to do what's called serological testing. This is the testing, the antibody testing, where you can tell whether someone in the past has had an infection, including COVID-19. Uh, the problem we have had is that we do not yet have a test that is as good as we would want, even with the expertise of the academic sector, Porton Down and their expertise, Public Health England and their expertise, and industry. Uh, and many different people are trying to work on an improved test. There are, there are fairly good tests at the moment on this, but there are not very good tests. This is one of the critical bits of information we need to make decisions, uh, and I'm hoping uh, but I've been hoping for a while, so I don't want to overpromise on this, that we will shortly have tests that are good enough to get at least a ranging shot as to what proportion of people in different age groups in different parts of the country have had this virus. But we're not yet at the point, I think, where we have a test we can say that reliably, uh, but I'm hope hoping we will be able to do so uh, in the pretty near future. Well, would, you, would you like a follow-up there? Yeah, if that's all right. We obviously, sure. have, we obviously sure. have heard from so many places now that there's a real shortage of PPE. Are the military themselves going to be protected enough when they're helping in these incidents and when they're deployed? And also, is there any update on what's happened with uh, the arrival of that PPE from Turkey? Is that on the front line with those medical staff that need it now, or is it still being checked? Well, we obviously very carefully check all the consignments that we get. We've had reports in other countries um, of of PPE that's then distributed to the front line, it isn't effective. Not only does it have to be withdrawn, but then you have to isolate or uh, send into self-isolation the care workers. So we do check that very carefully. The consignment, and we are expecting further consignments in the future. But as um, Chris mentioned earlier, uh, it's an incredibly competitive market, and it just shows you that Turkish challenge uh, that we had. 
uh, how you need to have excellent cooperation with the Turkish government. And I uh, had conversations uh, over the weekend with my Turkish opposite number and also how the MOD and the FCO have worked hand in glove together. And it's a team effort to, to get all of the supplies we possibly can. And we'll continue to do it. Um, we obviously don't want and we'll take every step we can to avoid, for, for all of those reasons, any risk to anyone on the front line in terms of the quality of the, the PP. I don't know, Nick, whether you want to say anything more about that in relation to the military. Yes, uh, Laura, those military personnel who are deployed alongside um, healthcare workers and the like um, are equipped in the same way that they are for the function that they're performing. Tom Newton Dunn from The Sun. Uh, Foreign Secretary, thank you very much. A question to you and then to Chief Medical Officer, if I may. Uh, we understand that SAGE haven't looked again at uh, the issue of wearing masks and they've decided to advise you that uh, it would be a good idea to wear some sort of face cloth or otherwise for people who are asymptomatic but able to um, uh, transmit the disease themselves. When are you going to meet to decide on that? And it doesn't look like time today. What's your advice to people tomorrow morning going to work? Should they or should they not be uh, wearing face masks to protect people? And to the Chief Medical Officer, can you say a little bit about the work you're doing at the moment uh, for the end of the month on restrictions? What sort of shape is that taking? And in particular on the First Secretary's fifth and uh, most important test, as he says, on avoiding a second peak and being sure you can do that. What earth can you ever get yourself in the position that you are sure? It almost seems an inability, or are you confident you can design some sort of new metric for that? I'll let Chris answer that one. On, on Mars, uh, Sage, as always the case, will look at the evolving evidence as we learn lessons through this uh, crisis. Uh, they have been asked to look at the Mars issue again. We haven't had the advice uh, back yet, so nothing will change until we've had that and considered it. Um, in terms of uh, what we're looking to the future, and of course you're absolutely right, this is a, an, a critical question, not just for the UK, but for other countries, and uh, we share our experiences. Um, the, uh, there is an upper and a lower bound of what is possible. The upper bound of this is we cannot allow the R, the force of transmission, to go above one for any extended period at any point, because if it does, exponential growth of this will continue, uh, it'll resume, and we will get back to a situation where the NHS could have its emergency services overwhelmed, which we've managed to avoid due to the remarkable work of the NHS itself in expanding its uh, activities, the British public, in heeding the advice to stay home uh, and uh, significant help, of course, uh, from the armed forces. So, uh, but if it goes back up and you get exponential growth, where you get a doubling time of a few days, let us say, it does not take very long before you move from bad numbers to really bad numbers uh, over, over quite a short period of time. Uh, and at, one, at some point to the point where the, the NHS would really uh, find it very difficult. So we cannot allow that to happen. At the bottom end of the, in a sense, the other end of the bracket of what's possible is this disease is not going to be eradicated. It is not going to disappear. So we have to accept that we are working with a disease that we are going to be with globally. This is a global problem for the foreseeable future. And what we're trying to work out is what are the things which actually add up to an R of less than one. Uh, and there are lots of different options which ministers will then have to consider. But that narrows our options quite significantly if you're having to keep the R below one. And I think we have to be very realistic that if people are hoping that it's suddenly going to move from where we are now in lockdown suddenly into everything's gone, that is a wholly unrealistic expectation. We're going to have to do a lot of things for really quite a long period of time. The question is, what is the best package? And this is what we're trying to work out. But if you release more of one area, you have to keep it on board more of another area. So there is actually a proper trade-off. And this is what ministers will, are having to consider. Tom, would you like to follow up on any of that? Uh, just a quick one. I think still people are going to be in some doubt whether to wear face masks tomorrow morning after your question, but uh, I don't think I'm going to get much more. Uh, can I just quickly follow up with um, Professor Witte? Uh, very interesting on what you're saying about the R. It is simply establishing R below one enough for you on easing these particular restrictions, whatever effect that has? Or would you be wanting to go down to 0 0.5, 0 0.25, or, or, or whatever? Is it just a case of simply uh, a, a, a tiny percentage below, or can you calculate something that you'll be extremely comfortable with? 
well, R going below, not going above one is a minimum ask. That absolutely has to happen. There are then a number of, from a purely health point of view, and this goes back to something I've said before, but I will repeat myself because obviously there may be a different, a different audience. There are multiple different ways in which this epidemic is going to kill people or cause ill health. The direct causes of death from the COVID, uh, the potential of the indirect causes of death if the NHS gets overwhelmed, which we have absolutely been determined should not happen. It has not happened. It, we are determined it does not happen. But the third area uh, is people who die indirectly because the health service has had to be reoriented towards COVID and therefore you can't do other things, elective things, screening, a number of other things that the NHS normally would do. But there is also a final group, which is if uh, the um, interventions we have extend uh, deprivation uh, among people, that is also a risk to their long-term health. And all of these are going to have to be taken into account from a health point of view. And they don't all lead to exactly, if you're optimising it for one, you may not be optimising it for another. So what we have to do is think very seriously about this. What is the best balance of measures that gives us the best public health outcome, which is, is, does absolutely include people who die sadly directly of COVID, but also has to include all these other factors. Thanks, Tom. Can we go next to Gordon Rayner from, Gordon. The, Rayner from the Telegraph? Uh, Thank you, First Secretary. Uh, can I ask a question for yourself and the CMO first? Uh, can you guarantee the public that if the Oxford or Imperial vaccine trials uh, prove successful, um, British people who've paid for those trials will be the first to get the vaccine? Um, can I also ask the CMO, is it possible, just following on Tom's question, is it possible for us to ease the lockdown measures before we have a contract a contact tracing system in place, which uh, the Health Secretary has been talking about quite a lot today. Um, and sorry, just lastly, what, one question for the, for the First Secretary specifically. Um, in, uh, in October 2016, the government ran uh, a pandemic drill called Exercise Cygnus, as you'll know. Um, it involved all major government departments and simulated an epidemic similar to the one we're facing today. Um, tens of thousands of people died in the simulation uh, but its findings have never been published. Um, can you today commit to making those documents publicly available? Um, no, I can't. Uh, I think if they were conducted in the circumstances that you describe, um, I'd have to look very carefully uh, at the rules around it, but um, I'm happy to take that away and have a look at it. Chris, on the other points. Uh, vaccines, um, well, I mean, that, in a sense, that's a commercial question as much as it is a scientific question. Uh, we, obviously, the UK is going to want to get early or very or, or you know as fast as we possibly can access to any effective vaccine in a sense whether it's developed in the UK or developed somewhere else but a lot of work has been put into at the moment both trying to support the science so that a an initial vaccine can be done and we support this directly in the UK and indirectly elsewhere uh, through uh, other routes uh, but even once you've got a vaccine, this is a point Sir Patrick Valance has made several times, the government chief standing advisor, you then have to go into big trials and then also, and this is the bit people often forget, into manufacturing and scaling up. And all the way along that path, we're going to want to keep track of this and make sure that the UK uh, has access. But I mean, this is not a straightforward uh, position. Uh, in terms of the lockdown question, um, Essentially, there are quite a large number of possible combinations of things you can do. Uh, you're certainly right that contact tracing uh, is one of those. But I think what, you know, what I, I think we need to do is put to ministers all the various things that are possible. And at that point, they will decide what the right combination is that achieves the best uh, public health and wider social goals. I mean, Gordon, just on the, that, I mean, the, the, let's be clear about this. A vaccine is not going to come in any time uh, particularly soon to allow us to ease out of the current social distancing measures into a transition. I think it would, and I'll be corrected if I'm inaccurate about this, it would be more likely to be uh, of particular value in stopping a second global wave down the track if we don't eliminate um, coronavirus uh, for good. So I just add to that. So I think um, in the long run, the exit from this is going to be one of two things, uh, ideally, one of which is a highly effective vaccine and there are a variety of ways vaccines can be deployed. Uh, they can be deployed for damping down epidemics, they can be deployed to protect vulnerable people, or, and or, highly effective drugs so that people stop dying of this disease 
uh, even if they uh, catch it or which can prevent uh, this disease in vulnerable people. Uh, until we have those and the probability of having those any time in the next calendar year are incredibly small, and I think we should be realistic about that, mm -hmm. we're going to have to rely on other social measures, which of course are very socially disruptive, as everyone is, is finding at the moment. But until that point, that is what we will have to do, and it will have to be the, the, the best combination uh, that maximises uh, the outlooks. But it's going to take a long time, and I think we need to be aware of that. Gordon, do you want to come back on any of that? Well, just briefly, uh, on to, to Professor Whitty, um, if you're saying that, that you don't expect a vaccine to be available in the next calendar year, um, are you effectively saying that we're going to have very socially disruptive measures for probably the next calendar year? And um, sorry, just, just to come back, First Secretary, on exercise signal very quickly, could I just ask, have you personally read that, that document and has it been made available to all your key scientific advisors? Um, I would have to go and check. Um, I've read a huge volume uh, over recent weeks, um, but uh, it's not something that immediately springs to mind. Um, Chris, on the, on the vaccines, I mean, I, I'm very hopeful that we will have vaccines which have proof of concept uh, much earlier than a year, to be clear. And there are very large numbers of people around the world, very good groups, excellent ones in the UK, first vaccine uh, uh, tomorrow um, uh, in demand. Uh, here, uh, uh, but there is a long path between having a vaccine that's proof of concept and until we have either a vaccine or a drug, it doesn't, I mean, we have managed other epidemics without a vaccine, HIV is an example where it's managed with a drug um, uh, or combinations of drugs. But until we have th those solutions, yes, what we have available to us are social measures and that's obviously what we're using and what's the optimal uh, combination of those. And Gordon, the one thing I just add, and it's really important to reinforce this message, the lower we get the R level, the transmission rate, uh, the more options we have, which is why our message right now is uh, being just a focus on keeping up the adherence to the social distancing measures. It is making a big difference. And of course, the more we get the transmission level down, the wider the range of options that, that we would have in place. David Hughes from PA. Hello. Um, a way out of this is one of the times you're being one of the times you're considering a mass population testing program and if so how would that be administered and when it comes to contact tracing are you planning to rely on this new app that's being developed or are you thinking there's going to be a huge amount of manpower needed and if so is it something that general carter and the military would be involved in i think chris talk about the wider mapping look we're boosting the um, testing capacity, uh, we're looking at the functionality and the way the app would work. The more options, we, it, there are the two big factors, and it, I think it leans into the question um, that Gordon Rayner was asking, the two factors that will help give us a greater range as we transition to the next phase, when the evidence suggests that we can, we'll be getting the transmission level down and uh, the, the level of testing and the functionality of the, uh, the app in order to allow us to uh, look at the various different options and control any potential resurgence of the virus because we will want to be mitigating and keeping it as low as possible. So that's why we're putting so much effort uh, into the, not just the testing, but also the wider tracking and uh, tracing that could be put around that. Um, it, it can, as the, as the weeks uh, proceed, that could have a significant impact on our ability to, to ease out of the current social distancing measures. Chris, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do with testing. Um, uh, obviously, patient management, obviously allowing people who are uh, in lockdown and they've got a, a relative uh, in the house, and that's the reason they're there and they're key workers uh, to see if they're able to uh, go to work. Uh, obviously, though, and this is an area which we will be doing a lot more of, testing across the community to find out at the earliest possible stage if we're starting to see a resurgence of this virus. Because at the moment, we're relying on a situation when people get as far as hospital. If they do that, they'll have had five days in which they don't have any symptoms. They might have had up to a week when things are getting worse. And so you're, you're behind the curve if you rely on that. So we're going to certainly be doing a lot more population testing. And we'll go into details of that once we've got this uh, going very shortly um, uh, to find at the earliest point, is the R below one? Are we still going down? Or is there some part of the country where the R is beginning to go up, in which case uh, we then need to act? So that is going to be part of a wider range of things we need to do with the tests. And that's why we set those tests out, the five principles, out last Thursday, because all of those factors inform uh, the proposals and any future decisions we, we might make. David, would you like a follow-up there? 
Uh, yeah, just on the on the contact tracing app, do you think the British public would be willing to install this on their smartphones given the necessary invasion of privacy it would entail? Uh, and what about the proportion of the population that don't have a smartphone or wouldn't feel confident in using it? Well, look, both good points. I think overwhelmingly what the public expect of us right now is to innovate as best we can to try and ease our way out to the next phase of this virus in a way that protects public health, uh, but also allows us to go back to the kind of economic uh, social life that is as close to normal as possible. So we'll innovate in those areas, and if we come up with something which uh, is, a, is effective, we'll have to look at those decisions. Um, but I think people do understand that we're in an exceptional crisis, and we need to take measures that we probably wouldn't think about doing if we weren't in this crisis. Kate Wilson from the Bristol Post. Good evening. Um, firstly, to the Chief Medical Officer, as we've already heard, the Health Secretary, Secretary said this afternoon, the UK has now reached the peak of the coronavirus outbreak. Does that peak extend to places like the Bristol area, where the numbers of cases and deaths are much lower than in other parts of the country, or could they peak later? And therefore, will Bristol's Nightingale Hospital, which is going to be ready to take its first patients from this weekend, still be needed? And secondly, for the First Secretary, we know that two-thirds of SMEs in Bristol have stopped trading since lockdown began. If Bristol's figures have indeed peaked at a lower level, would you consider an earlier exit from lockdown in order to restart the economy here? Chris, thank, you. Do you want, do you want, thank you very much, uh, Kate. Do you want to go first, Chris? Uh, so I'll, I'll go on the, obviously on the, on the issue about um, the numbers. Uh, you're, of course, right that the South West has had probably the least uh, impact from COVID so far. I mean, Bristol itself uh, for, has had uh, under 500 cases uh, from memory. Uh, it's also true uh, in the uh, social care setting so there's a there's a smaller proportion of social uh, of care care homes have been affected by covid outbreaks in the southwest uh, uh, than they have in other parts of the country so of course that is absolutely right the thing about the the uh, the peak we are going through at the moment however is that it's not in a sense the natural peak of an epidemic without us doing anything it's a peak brought about by the british people staying at home and actually not giving the virus the opportunity to spread. And therefore, the actual peak of it uh, is likely to occur uh, in most parts of the country at really a very similar time. There is a little bit of evidence that uh, as a slightly earlier effect in London, but really elsewhere, there is a little bit of regional variation, but there's much less because basically this is an artificial peak brought about by our activity than there might have been had this been uh, been running uh, un un unmitigated, which clearly was absolutely uh, what we are trying to avoid. Uh, in terms of the Nightingale in, in Bristol, and this would be true of all the Nightingales, uh, it, it, uh, it firstly gave us the ability, if this had, the British people had not heeded quite to the fantastic extent they had, and there'd been more pressure on the NHS, it gave us capacity to deal with emergencies. Um, it still will give us, and the other nightingales will give us flexibility, because if you think about the two forms of uh, concern that I was talking about earlier, the direct deaths, but also the indirect deaths, having the nightingale capacity, enormous help from the armed forces uh, in setting up so fast, uh, does actually mean that when we're planning forward, this does give us a number of options we would not have had if those were not there. Now we shall see how they are properly used I'm absolutely delighted that the Nightingales have really not had to be used in great numbers for COVID because that is, in a sense, a sign of success. We have had a, been able to cope with this within the, uh, the, the emergency environment of the NHS already. But the NHS is going to be under pressure from COVID uh, for really quite a long time. And having that flexibility is an additional thing we can uh, work out, work through in, try in terms of how best to deploy uh, NHS uh, resources uh, for the next uh, several months. Okay, look, small businesses are the lifeblood of our economy. Uh, they're going through a really tough time right now. SMEs create the lion's share of jobs in this country. They have done uh, over a sustained period. So, so we absolutely want to see them through this crisis and they'll be part of Britain bouncing back uh, in due course. But the risk right now, not just for public health, but for all of those small businesses, is that if we move too early to ease up in the way that your question suggested, not only would we get a second spike in the virus, we would need to then have a second lockdown. That would protract the economic pain and all of the uncertainty that goes with it. 
Um, I can tell you that in terms of uh, the support given to Bristol City Council, they've been allocated more than £88 million as part of the government's business support package. Um, we've identified 8,000 business properties which uh, may be eligible for a grant. More than 4,000 grant payments have been made. And, and on top of that, we've got the loan guarantees, the coronavirus job retention scheme, uh, deferral of VAT payments, tax relief and, and other cash grants. So uh, I, I take your point that we're, they're the heart and soul of this country, small businesses, we'll do everything we can, but I think it would be counterproductive, if not dangerous, if we eased up too early, uh, not just for public health, but also for entrepreneurs. Would you like to come back on any of that? To get the last Thank word. The, um, the only thing I wanted, just a little bit more detail if we could on um, the arms role as part of the um, Nightingale Hospital in Bristol. So I know you said they've been helped helpful in setting it up are they also going to be helping to staff it as well once, it, once it's up and running the way that the military have tended to work with all the nightingale hospitals that are passed on to cds to supplement is to support what the nhs uh, workers are doing um, and so it will depend on the specifications uh, for each nightingale hospital but they're there to support uh, the nhs staff uh, cynic is there anything you'd add to that for, for bristol Yes, I mean, in Bristol, we have allocated some combat medics to act as nurses and the like, uh, and some sort of general duties personnel to help support it as well. Thanks very much, Kate. That's all, I think, uh, for this press conference. Thank you all.